sent me a message back in September or October or something like that, wanted me to give a talk at this talk, uh, at this uh, symposium in honor of uh, Rupa Sankofa. So I didn't answer him for a long, I mean, a long time. I, I, I was going to decline because I have not been, been active in research for a decade or more you know, on that return. But I talked to a group finally, and uh, he said, look, it doesn't matter what you say. You know, you just come here and uh, uh, say some, say some, give some history, and you know, people are, are going to be tolerant. And so I, I agreed to come. And so I'll be uh, talking about the uh, reactions within residents. And, and, and mostly I'll be talking about how the field of ion exchange evolved from a uh, simple ion exchange, which is uh, the uh, movement of uh, counter ions in and, and, uh, and, and out of uh, resins, uh, to reactive polymers, which is what we've been talking about all, all this time. My, my people whose work I'm describing here, I should say co-authors because I haven't really talked to any of them about what I'm doing, but uh, our group, uh, Suresh Subramanian, Leo Mark, uh, C.C. Lin, and, and there's some others that I'll be talking about too. The person on the right here, and this is back in from the, the 80s, this guy is um, a group. And, um, at that time, he was a student of mine, an undergraduate student. He was an outstanding student, but I had no idea that the outstanding engineer, and I mean, uh, Desmond showed in the last slide. You know, I, I, I was going to have a slide, I'm glad I did. I wrote it down anyway. He's an engineer, a researcher, an inventor, a teacher, a philosopher, a poet, a humanitarian, an administrator, and a friend. And so, uh, in that sense, uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, he came to me in December of 1980. And uh, why? Because it was warmer in Houston than the city. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't come to study. I don't think so, anyway. Uh, and, that, uh, and he was very confident because he wanted, uh, uh, he wanted, uh, it was in December, he wanted to be a, a funded graduate student in January. And you know, usually that process takes months to years to take. But I looked at his resume and I, and I, and I took him on. Uh, you know, he's a gold medal chemical engineering graduate from Philadelphia University. And uh, it, it turned out I was made a good choice because he turned out to be the top student in physical chemical processes and instrumental methods of analysis. But he wanted to study chromate in, in water. And um, the last talk, unfortunately, I didn't know this, but it was about chromate and chromate in drinking water. And I was funded, actually, at that time by the uh, Cooperative Research Agreement with the EPA for the removal of inorganic contaminants from groundwater. And one of those contaminants was chromate. And so we made an agreement, and he, and he had worked with cooling water uh, at Kuljian Corporation, I believe, in India, and he, he wanted to uh, study uh, chromate, and because he had a lot of ideas about it, it turned out to be good ideas, and fundamentally he was worried, uh, fascinated by the fact that chromate, even though it was highly preferred by the resident, always leaked early, uh, and he wanted to do some research on that. So he did uh, some research on cooling water, and. Uh, Compensatory research in drinking water. Uh, here he is uh, in uh, about 1984. He stands out for some reason. You can see there's a group. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, whoops, I, I uh, pressed the wrong button here. Uh, there is a, let's see, there he is. Uh, at that time, uh, I was uh, there, Dr. Jim Simons, who's still uh, alive and well in Florida, Professor Ed Bauer, who uh, I not too long ago, uh, that was at Johns Hopkins, and, uh, and then uh, and here's the group, some of the other students. And next year, uh, we have, um, we have, uh, here's a group, and his wife, Susmita, uh, myself, and uh, uh, my wife, and uh, Dr. Jim Simon, and Dr. Jerry Spitell, who is still at, at Texas right now, he's still there. <laughs> um, and uh, Suresh Sutherland. This is what I looked like back in the 80s. I had hair back there like this. Like We didn't look that much different, actually. <laughs> my, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was thin and I had long hair. But uh, three years later, I'm not thin with a lot. I have uh, a group looks pretty much the same, and our wives look not so much different, but uh, I'm aging. <laughs> 
Uh, in 2017, we invited him as a distinguished lecturer at the University of Houston, and he is shown here uh, looking the same as he was back in you know, 1980, uh, with his uh, presenting me a, a, a copy of his book, Environmental Time Exchange and Environmental Processes. So really, I, I, I want to talk a really, really, really little history about uh, how I view the fact that mining exchange evolved from uh, ion exchange uh, to reactive polymers, ion exchangers, and absorbents, and then finally reactive polymers. This is a journal that uh, both myself and Arup have edited, and North American editors over the years. And so in, in 1980s, the reactive polymers, ion exchangers, and absorbents, and eventually just reactive polymers. Ion exchange, uh, back in the day when I first started with it wasn't a reaction, it was just a redistribution of counter ions between an ion exchange and a solution. So we have a bead with uh, uh, counter ions, uh, B and, and, uh, and, and co ions, A and the, uh, I mean, it's going to be fixed charges in the resin, and the, the, the counter ions, A and B, just exchange. The resin was thought to be somewhat of a uniform high, like a one molar concentration of charges, somewhat uh, reasonably uh, uniformly discharged. Or separated. The, the uh, resin preferences for counter ions uh, was in those days based on a couple of things. The higher charge to the ions were preferred if the solution was the loop that you were working with. Hydrated ions were always preferred, uh, things like uh, iridium. I mean, the, the, the hydrated size of the ion was what would cause it to be, to be preferred. The smaller the better. And of course, in those days, in, in, uh, so today we, we had an acid-base reaction, like weak acid cation resonance, uh, and carboxylate groups reacted strongly with hydrogen, and weak base anion resonance, and, and, and propane form reacts strongly with um, hydroxide ions. There were also chelating resins available at that, at that time. Mostly it was about there was one main resin, amino diacetate resin was available back in that time. So the variety was minimal. There were strong acid cation resins. Uh, Strong base anion, weak acid cation, weak base anion, and there's some, at least one chelating resin. My own research started really in the 70s on nitrate removal from water using strong and weak base resins. The basic problem is still and was then that uh, sulfate is preferred over nitrate and uh, uh, chloride and bicarbonate. So nitrate is preferred over those other two, but sulfate was always preferred. And those other lines were always there, so the run lines were basically no more than a few hundred bed lines in a typical water. And the goal was to find resin that prefer monovalent nitrate over divalent sulfate. That was the, the idea. And so what I did at that time was I, I, I got a sample of every resin I could get my hands on and a strong and weak-based resin, and I evaluated them for sulfate nitrate selectivity. Matrices of styrene, styrene, benzene, acrylic, epoxy, phenolic, uh, type 1, type 2 resins, ter tertiary resin, polyamine resins, porosities, uh, the gel resin, the macro, and the iso, which is basically a, a measure of the uh, cross linking capacity from 1 to about 2.5, and, and, and acidity, uh, acidity uh, pK, from 7 to about 13. What we found was that uh, styrene divinyl benzene resins represented here. This 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 is a uh, an isotherm where this is the resin phase concentration and this is the equivalent fraction. This is the aqueous phase equivalent fraction. That styrene divinyl benzenes of all different varieties here had a modest preference for sulfate always. And uh, see here, 10 percent sulfate in the in the aqueous phase for about three. Uh, 36% in the uh, in the resin phase with separation factor of about you know three and a half. But you know, uh, styrene dimethyl benzene resins have the functional groups are not in the matrix. They're pendant. They're pendant on the matrix. So here's the matrix: styrene cross-linked with dimethyl benzene. But the functional groups are hanging off. So these are, 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 uh, are tertiary functional groups and quaternary functional groups. They're randomly separated apart. There's no guaranteed closeness in the resin. So uh, those resins had a, uh, 
a modest divalent preference, and that the proximity between the exchange groups was variable and not guaranteed. But now the epoxy mean resin, and a, and a resin that was described in the last a resin of type of weak base resins uh, that have nitrogen in the matrix was described during the last uh, of paper with an extreme affinity for chromium. Uh, these epoxy mean resins with uh, nitrogen in the matrix uh, they have Nitrogens that are separated, they're in the matrix and they're separated by two carbons and three carbons. They're guaranteed to be close together. And those resins had extreme selectivity for divalent ions. Now we just saw, I, mean, I didn't even know who was going to present that paper, but there, there was a resin described, you know, that, that, like this that had extreme reference for, for chromium. And um, so resin with nitrogen in the matrix, so this is. Um, some uh, uh, epoxyamine and poly polyamine weak base anion resins. And with 10% uh, of 10% uh, of, of sulfate in the aqueous phase, there is better than 95%. I mean, if you can draw a line there. They have extreme preferences for divalent ions. And so that led to uh, people like Jerry Gooder, Dr. Jerry Gooder. He was the researcher for, he was working for a boil engineering company at that time. And uh, so he got the idea, he was, he was studying nitric removal. He said, well, why don't we make some resins um, that increase the, uh, that, that increase the, the separation distance. So here's a typical quaternary type one resin trimethyl resin, and it's, 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 nit it's sulfate, excuse me, it's nitrate, nitrate, nitrate sulfate selectivity is 0.3. In other words, it's three times more favorable for sulfate. But he had a resin made triethyl resin. Now triethyl resin, the sulfate selectivity reversed. Just by adding that one methyl group, now the separation factor went from 0.3 to 2. And then uh, he added, uh, well, he, he actually had the IMAC, I believe, made these resins for him. And, and, and he, so he went from the triethyl um, to the tribulo to tri tri resin with enormous selectivity for uh, monovalent ions. I mean, the divalent ions couldn't find satisfactory, they were the charges, but so far apart, they couldn't find satisfactory ones. So, he also uh, said, well, you know, that this is not just a separation distance, it's, it's hydrophobicity because when we add methyl groups, we, we separate the exchange sites and they become hydrophobic uh, because, of, because of the additional of the CH3 groups, CH2 groups. And that favors nitrate, which is really a hydro, a hydrophobic anion. And so is charge separation really a major factor? And to answer that question, one of my students, Suresh Sabramonian, who was studying just after uh, Peru, uh, he did some experiments with dicarboxylic acids. And, and so he had acids from uh, the dicarboxylic, from oxalic to what's so very, so the anion charges were separated by two to seven carbons. And then he if you put those in resins with, um, a variable separation distance like to triethyl and tripropyl and tributyl resins to see if they could match the size uh, distance. And so varying the site distance in the carboxylic carboxylic acid looks something like this, where the resin is here, and maybe the, the tributyl resin has a separation like this. And, the, the, the two or three carbon has this, the, this, the oxalic acid has this sort of separation. So just trying to find that the site where, where there would be a match between the, the separation distance on the resin and the separation distance uh, in, the, in the dicarboxylic acid. And he did find that an optimal site spacing does exist. And these are two plots of 
on the on the y-axis is the the the, uh, this, the selectivity coefficient for the divalent monovalent exchange. This is dicarboxylic chloride, and this is uh, the same over here. This is for the triethylamine resin, which has you know uh, decent separation distance, and this the, the tributyl, which has enormous separation distance. And what we found was that yes, in fact, there is an optimal point that is the highest selectivity of the tri. Uh, ethylamine corresponding to three carbon atoms separation and the tributylamine with five carbon separation atoms, saying that hey, there is the starch separate, it's not just a random bunch of charges, there are separation distances that can be adjusted and, and, and resins can be made uh, like that. So, Arup's work with uh, chromate, among many other things, it showed that the resin preference for divalent ion. Uh, caused the, the dimerization of chromate within resin. So, in the slightly acidic region where bichromate exists, in the resin, dichromate exists. It doesn't exist in the aqueous phase, but it does exist in, in, the, in the resin phase uh, because the resin actually prefers uh, divalent sites rather than monovalent sites. Even most resins prefer divalent sites, some extreme, but all of them prefer divalent at, at low ion strength. This resulted in an unfavorable lysotherm and unavoidable graduate, a gradual breakthrough of chromate, which he uh, uh, you know, published significantly on that. This extended our work related to resin divalent ion preferences causing acid dissociation in resins. Now, we had a paper earlier sometime yesterday talking about uh, the uptake of bicarbonate on resins what we found is, yes, bicarbonate is taken up on resin, but if you put bicarbonate into a resin, whoops. Um, if you put bicarbonate into a resin, if there's two sites close together, it kicks off the proton <coughs> and comes carbonate. Now that carbonate then, uh, you know, just doesn't stay here, reacts with other uh, bicarbonates to form CO2. And uh, this is C.C. Lin, um, Student of well, he was a field researcher and he was working on nitrate removal. And he, he was the only, he was, he was running a, a, a mobile lab overnight, and, you know, 24 7. And I asked him, you know, when you're running these experiments, how do you know when nitrate's going to break through? He said, well, when the pH of the effluent equals the pH of the influent, nitrate is breaking through. And I said, what the heck? What's that about? So let me show you a slide that shows why that's true. The uh, Leo, Leo Warren worked with. Uh, with the, uh, the monovalent arsenate is converted to a divalent arsenate with the expulsion of a, uh, of a proton. Now, of course, you don't get much, I mean, if this is a trace, it's very different. Now, this is milligrams per liter for bicarbonate. This is micrograms per liter for arsenate. But he did experiments with higher concentrations and found that there were very much pH effects due to uh, this, this reaction. The residents will convert uh, monovalent to a divalent ion depending on the structure of the resin. And these, uh, these cause pH waves in anion column. Polychromic anions, particularly bicarbonate, are converted to carbonate and release a proton and lowers the pH. The pH waves then uh, result in the effluent and they can signal the breakthrough. So, so here's what's, you know, what's happening. Uh, it's a polystyrene, uh, that on a benzene type resin. And, and here's a site that doesn't have uh, another closely charged one. So that'll pick up a bicarbonate without any trouble. Whereas here's two uh, sites close together. Uh, they prefer uh, a carbonate ion, uh, and so they'll kick off a proton. So the bicarbonate becomes carbonate with, with a proton. Now, that proton reacts with bicarbonate in, in the solution, which is so still there in the aqueous phase form CO2 and water. Now we've verified that this happens by measuring the CO2 in the effluent of columns to prove this is in fact what happens. So this very complicated looking curve here. Um, th this is the, uh, my researcher, C.C. Lin there, he was saying that when, now here's, here's a nitrate removal, a resin in the chloride form being fed nitrate chloride uh, bicarbonate and sulfate. 
And then we look at the breakthrough curve um, from the chloride exchange. Now, the feed pH here, the feed, the feed pH is 8. The, the pH is on this axis over here. So the feed pH, whereas the effluent pH goes from, it starts out at 5, and it gradually, it, it gradually comes up to the influent uh, pH of 8. And so we said, when the influent equals the influent, that's when nitrate. It just happens that's the case. Well, at that time, uh, here's the effluent of so-called bicarbonate. Well, this here, because the pH is, is so high at 9, this is a uh, significant carbonate uh, effluent. So what you're seeing here, and, and Dow eventually, I mean, this wasn't so well known that if you take a, a, a neutral water and pass it into an anion, you're going to get a pH of of uh, five. Uh, okay. Um, so the feed pH is eight. The F one pH is is five, and then it goes up to eight, and, and the signals the breakthrough. Uh, now, in, precipitation in resin was was done uh, in my remember back in 1984. Now, at at, uh, at the University of New Mexico, precipitated barium sulfate into resins. And it wasn't, you know, this state pretty much a stagnant field until the roof and the students really developed the, the, the precipitation in the resins as a, as a major deal. Uh, but he produced a, a pattern back in 1984. And so radium, um, the, the, the typical way to remove radium uh, from water is co-precipitation with barium sulfate. And so barium sulfate will pick up trace radium into the crystal and become barium radium sulfate. Anyway, that was a standard way to remove um, the treating pond water to remove radium. And so the, the, the radium selected complex it was a polystyrene cation resin with the, uh, barium sulfate, where he, he took the resin in the hydrogen form, passed barium hydroxide to it to form the, the, the barium form, and then, and then converted that to the hydrogen form of sulfuric acid precipitating barium sulfate. Uh, so anyway, it's with some, with some it's the, the conclusion from these uh, things that I've been trying to show you was that, 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 that we've had some, you know, our students or groups have had a significant amount of a, a contribution to the conversion from ion exchange to reactive polymers. Because today we have nitrate-selective, radium-selective, high X nano iron, and uh, three different uh, resins that, that, uh, that are root uh, uh, Well, I can't get the chart. Um, it, uh, many, many different sh short diffusion path resins, which we described some of your super porous resins, carbonaceous adsorbents, arsenic-selective resins, boron, chromate, uh, Anyway, we, we've come a long way. And I just wanted to say, well, I was trying to figure out how to end this talk in the last week at a homily. I heard the priest say, you know, think of someone or something that you're grateful for. And since this is coming up, I thought, well, the group came from my way. And uh, so I want to finish this by saying, you know, it was Providence that he showed up on my doorstep about 40 some years ago. And uh, our, our, our career had both of them benefited from that. And, uh, and so has our friendship. So thank you. <laughs>